Thank you all very much for coming. Um, this is the talk, Security Not By Chance, the Altus Metrum Hardware Random Number Generator. I'm Tom Marble, and uh, some of you may know me. I want to say it's great to be back at DevConf. I missed last year, unfortunately. I'm really happy to be back. Um, Informatique is my company, and today I'm going to talk about random number generation. In fact, specifically a project that uh, uh, we're calling USB TRNG. Um, TRNG for true random number generation. So these are the things that I want to talk to you about today, give you a sense of you know what we're thinking. First of all, why do we care? Why do we care about randomness? What's the point? Um, how does this apply to GNU Linux? Um, a little bit about the design that we've got with Altus Metrum for this hardware random number generator, ways that we can measure its uh, quality and effectiveness, and then uh, think about uh, you know where we're going, where the next steps could be, and that's where we're hoping to get some good questions from you and uh, get some good feedback. Um, for those of you that uh, may be on the stream, you can join us uh, at DebConf uh, Room 329, and hopefully somebody's on IRC and keeping an eye on questions that might come in. Be glad to take those, and I just want to shout out to the Debian video team. I think it's really awesome that uh, we can live stream uh, all of the talks. So, why do we care? Random numbers are actually a really important uh, component of security. Uh, random numbers are used to make uh, encryption keys. You may have noticed when you generate your GPG key, it takes a while because the system needs to have enough entropy to create a random key for you. Um, more frequently, whenever you use uh, SSL, you go to a, a HTTPS website, there is a unique session key that is created between your browser and the server which is used to encrypt the session using a, a traditional cipher. But that password, that session key, is actually coming from the random number generator. And if, and if uh, we can guess what it is, that's going to compromise security. And of course, randomness is used in a lot of other places, in the kernel and elsewhere, for security applications. So it actually ends up being an important element of security overall. And I think that you know we all know that security is becoming increasingly important in everything that we do. Just a little bit of background on uh, random number generation. Typically there are two different kinds that we need to talk about, or talk about how TRNG is different from PRNG. Uh, PRNG refers to pseudo-random number generators, which are basically uh, varieties of algorithms that take a certain seed or input and then have a formula for generating a sequence of bits which to as much of a statistical measure as possible appear like they're random. But they're not actually random. If I start a PRNG with the exact same seed, I will get the exact same sequence of numbers out of it. Sometimes that's really helpful. For example, if you're testing software and you want to test different elements of software, you may want to have something that is sort of random, but that a regression test can catch any changes in the output. In that case, a PRNG is perfect for that. Um, you might argue that there are other kinds of testing that would be a little bit more dynamic, like generative testing or property-based testing, which might be better. But there are some, some good uses for, for PRNGs, and in particular, they're fast. So um, we can get a number, a uh, reasonably uh, random number from a PRNG quite quickly. Getting true entropy or randomness uh, requires a hardware random number generator, uh, because what we're really looking for is to get randomness that's based on some physical process, some Brownian motion, some source of variability that um, is not at all deterministic, that could not be anticipated or guessed by any other means. Uh, many of you may be familiar with dev random in the Linux kernel, which will block until the kernel has made an assessment that there's actually enough entropy to release more bits. So what are the risks involved with uh, random numbers? Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, session keys are in, uh, encrypted with, uh, or, or created with random numbers often. So the, the significance of this is even if we have a fantastic public key infrastructure and RSA keys, instead of having to, to break an RSA key, a 4K RSA key, if all someone has to do is guess your session key, they could decrypt your, your traffic potentially. 
So again, as, as you all know, security is often dominated by the weakest possible link, and what we're doing here is we're trying to shore up the randomness as one of the potential vulnerabilities in our security. So there was an interesting post by Greg K.H. earlier this year, uh, which is pointing to a blog post by Thomas Hughes about myths about you random. And, um, this is important because if Greg K.H. says something, people are going to pay attention and they're going to listen. So in this uh, blog post, Hoon is talking about how people are rallying against DevViewRandom, which is the uh, pseudorandom number generator, uh, if you will, in the kernel. Um, the, the, it's often used in many Linux applications because it does not block. It's often seeded from dev random, but it is uh, actually a sequence of uh, pseudorandom uh, numbers that are uh, provided for you for the kernel. It doesn't block. It's very fast. The downside is it ha has all of the downsides that could come with a pseudorandom number. Um, and so people were debating about, you know, the differences between dev random, which blocks until the kernel uh, makes a determination there's enough entropy or not. So it's a very interesting uh, post, and there are a lot of good points that come out on it, but the thing I want to tell you, or the, the thing you, uh, you should take away, is that the entire argument is predicated on this one comment, and that is that uh, the outcome, or the security, is depending upon having enough random, randomness or entro entropy at the <coughs> beginning. Maybe 256 bits is enough. Hmm. So let's think about that. Do we know that we have enough randomness at the beginning? What if we don't? What if we don't have enough randomness in the beginning? I want to share with you an interesting research paper uh, from the University of Michigan and other sources. Henniger um, have a, a great paper on weaknesses in security specifically due to weaknesses in randomness. Um, this is specifically talking about the weaknesses of Debbie Random. Um, and in this paper, they talk about the existence of a boot time entropy hole that leaves systems vulnerable, especially in headless and embedded devices. So let's think about all the servers that are running web services on the web that you maintain probably fall into this category, especially if they're in the cloud. I won't go into all the details of this paper. It's really interesting. I'd highly recommend that you read it. And I will make my slides available so you don't have to jot down URLs or anything. Uh, in the paper, they examine over 10 million sites. And they found, by just doing simple scanning, that there were a lot of duplicates and keys that, that, that were available on the net. And the short takeaway is that um, there are many keys that they found to be vulnerable due to a lack of randomness. And this includes uh, SSH keys and RSA keys. So this is the picture that I want to show you. This is the entropy loophole. Um, in this example, in this graph, what you see is time from boot, going from 0 to 70 seconds, and you have different events that are happening. This line here is the actual entropy that uh, is coming, is being collected by the kernel in dev random. This line here is 192 bits. The kernel will not release bits out of dev random until there's this threshold of randomness. This crossing of the threshold happens in this study at 66 seconds. But let's look at what happens before 66 seconds after boot. This dotted line is the amount of bytes that are coming out of dev urandom since boot, the pseudorandom number generator. And the event that you should really care about happens here at four seconds. What happens then? SSH uses dev u random to seed its own internal key generation. So what this means is that SSH doesn't actually have enough entropy at four seconds to have a completely unpredictable set of keys. So this is a concern. I wanted to put this note in here, and this is mainly for when you review the slides later. Um, this paper is interesting because what it says is the kernel's estimate of entropy is actually fairly conservative, and it's pretty good. So we can use that. But this problem 
of random number generation in security has been discussed quite a bit. At South by Southwest, Edward Snowden made this comment, which was picked up by Matthew Green, who you might know as a cryptography researcher at Johns Hopkins. And after this, this tweet, uh, Green goes on to make a blog post, and I, I have the URL, don't try to write it down, you can get it from the slides. Um, how do you know if a random number generator is working? And it's a great blog post because it highlights a lot of the challenges that we've got in security related to random numbers. One of the things that I learned, which I thought was interesting, is that uh, Intel's Ivy Bridge uh, randomness actually gives you bits that are the output of a pseudo random number generation process, not the entropy directly. So there's a concern about that, um, but what Green does is he talks about statistical tests that we can use to measure if something is actually random enough. It's a very hard problem. Related to this, and in a separate blog post, Green also talks about something I'm sure you're familiar with, those of you that are in security, it, uh, is the use of the dual ECDRBG uh, random number generator that has became a NIST proposal. For those that aren't familiar, this was a, an elliptic curve based random number generator that was proposed by NIST as a standard and found to have potential backdoors based on the way elliptic curves work. And curiously, the NSA paid RSA security a million dollars to make DC uh, dual EC DRBG the default RNG in all of RSA security products. So this at least should raise a question in our minds about uh, the cipher suites and the random number generators in particular that we're using when we're generating security related material. So now after hearing this, would you like some entropy? <laughs> yeah. Well we've got some challenges with TRNGs. They're, they can be expensive, they can be out of stock, they can be based on closed, closed designs. Um, Many of you, I know, are aware of the SimTech Entropy Key, and this is one of the early places that, that uh, I went to. Yeah, right. Sorry. <laughs> well, well, so, I, I mean, I had to put this, I, this is on the website, so I had to put this up, that uh, we don't have any in stock, and we don't know when we'll have more. I actually have about four, but you can't have them. <laughs> well, that's the problem. So that's why we're that's why we're here. And uh, uh, I don't know if Nibe is here in the audience. There he is. Um, but he contacted me and, and uh, let me know that he's working on a project. Um, maybe he can say some words about about uh, his RNG later. Uh, th but there's a nice website there. Not all in Japanese. Uh, <laughs> so there's some stuff in, in English there too. Um, and a very important Maitland uh, called to my attention that at LCA, uh, I believe it was earlier this year. I think it was a, at least a year ago. Maybe it was a year ago. So 13, maybe I've got the year wrong. No, no, it was, it was this year. It was this year? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, there, there was a, a discussion of RTL entropy, which is really interesting, using a DVB uh, a dongle with software-defined radio to use radio as a source of entropy. Um, and so I think it's an interesting approach. And uh, one of the things that I, that I said in you know, talking with my friends about this is that one thing that we could do and should do is when we have good sources of randomness that we can really trust, we ought to have secure ways of mixing the sources together because that actually makes the, the quality of the randomness increase. And there are cryptographic ways of doing that. It's, it's uh, fairly straightforward. So do we want more entropy? Yes, we do. So why do we want to go and make yet another hardware product? Well, because it's fun. <laughs> because we can. So I was thinking about this and thinking, who do I know that does hardware and software and believes in freedom? So I was thinking of our friends at Altus Metrum that do some really cool hardware designs. Uh, open hardware designs with free software and fly them in rockets and they actually got me excited in doing this and I'm going to be flying this in a rocket this weekend so I'm very excited about it and so I talked to my friends at Altus Metrum and then learned that you know they have actually a lot of experience in this they've uh, I tried to count and I don't know exactly how many open hardware designs there are but th at least over 15 um, on many different architectures and uh, a marvelously free real-time operating system with some really neat features that's actually very easy to understand and program. So, um, let me introduce to you 
B. Del Garby and Keith Packard. <laughs> We're my friends at Altus Metrum and that uh, I'm partnering with to do USB TRNG. So a little bit about the design. Um, I'd say NXP Cortex M0, um, typical USB key uh, based on a band gap voltage reference. Um, does noise amplification and um, uh, we can have BDL maybe say a few more words about the design at some point. It's boring. Um, <laughs> I oh this didn't show up so well. This is the this is this this is the schematic which which is all available on uh, the uh, Altus Metrum website and this is the interesting part with the diode and the op amps and stuff and going in. The rest is classic. Is that only one noise generator? The, 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 fir the first prototype, is this on? Test one, two, three, four, five, okay. The first hardware prototype has a single noise generator and it is afflicted with uh, low frequency uh, noise injected through the power supply that needs to be dealt with, which is part of the reason I'm not like handing out samples to folks to play with this weekend. Uh, there was a point in history where we thought the right thing to do is to arrive with enough of these to just hand them out to everybody, but, um, well, you know, life intruded. Uh, <coughs> that's the interesting bit. It's also the part I'm not happy with yet, so there will be more work. I, you guys know a lot about this problem. and I'll talk about how we solved it? I would love to have that conversation. That'd be wonderful. I, the, the only... <laughs> Brilliant. We, we, yeah. Uh, the, the, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so the the only the only thing I'll claim to have done that's at all novel in here is is the choice of the quote unquote Zener device. Um, mm -hmm. there, there's some interesting parts out now that are actually band gap voltage references and. Get away with a, a high HFE transistor. Yes, I know. There, there. Works much better. Okay. Well, let's have a conversation about that. I yeah. would love to improve that part of it. And um, as I say, what we have right now, which Tom's going to show in just a moment, are what I would affectionately refer to as version 0.1, you know, protos. No, they're not beta. <laughs> they're, not, they're, they're not beta. Well, so one of the nice things about having open hardware is you can go and grab things like you know the PC board design. So this is you know just a, a quick snapshot of the PC board design, which I wanted to have that image in mind of the the front, you know, the the front and the back of the part, so that when I show you the picture of version 0.1 you would sort of see that it sort of lines up. You've got all the cool cool bits there, and you've got the nice logo here, and the version 0 0.1 there. Um, and that's that's what it looks like. It's a little USB key that you plug into your computer and gives you good random numbers. It's too small. Too small. <laughs> Early prototype. So what's cool about this, for all of you, I don't need to you know, uh, belabor this point, but it's based on free software and open hardware uh, using licenses that you're very familiar with. Um, you know why, you know, it facilitates community collaboration and enables in independent implementation and discussion, which is actually the part of the reason that we're here because this security, I think, is uh, very much uh, in need of free software. I don't think we can get to really good security without, without freedom. Um, so having uh, independent implementations is great, and I, to my surprise, Keith told me that there is a, is a professor here <coughs> at Portland State that has taken their design and re-implemented it, um, and he's got it, but he couldn't find it to bring it in today. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's too small. It's too small. Okay, lost it. but I, but I thought it was really cool. I, I thought I would I would I'd do a shout out to to Bart Macy for actually re-implementing the design. Um, there's a lot of different ways to analyze uh, the quality of a random number generator. Actually, the fifth standard is pretty modest. Basically, I think it's effectively telling you is this thing alive or dead. Um, we can do, I think we can do much better. There are a number of test suites. I'd love to hear everyone's opinion about test suites that we can use to evaluate randomness. I put test U01 uh, up, which is one that has become very popular. Green's blog post mentions a number of other ways in which testing is tricky and needs to be thought out carefully. Obviously, that's, a, that's an important thing to do. The idea, I think, is to leverage the, you know, what Simtech did, the idea of connecting with uh, the entropy key daemon and EGD so that other applications can take advantage of the entropy pool. Um, so that's the plan. The current status, uh, as BDL pointed out, is we have an early prototype. Uh, we're designing the software. 
Um, life kind of kept me busy too, so we're still in the design phase. Um, I'm really keen on getting uh, the test suites uh, available to, to test not just our hardware solution for random number generation, but anyone that we might come up with, and I guess for extra credit, it'd be great if we could get these things in the archive so anyone could use them. Um, and so uh, I have here uh, the URL for the, the project on altusmetrum.org. It's USB TRNG. Um, there's already an Altus Metrum IRC channel. It's on our own OFTC network, hash Altus Metrum. And uh, there's a mailing list that we've just created for this uh, project on list.jg.com. So please come and participate. Give us your ideas. Give us your feedback. What are we going to do next? Well, we're going to continue to test the hardware, make, make some revisions, take your feedback, tweak it, revise it, uh, work on the software to integrate it. Um, Think about potential attack vectors, try to evaluate which ones are most likely, try and mitigate those kinds of attacks. Josh was telling me just at LinuxCon last week, he learned about or he was aware of KRNGD, which is I believe a daemon inside the kernel or a service inside the kernel that uh, manages entropy or provides entropy for different things like um, uh, I think um, sequence numbers for networking. Um, and I, I, I saw Talif earlier and I told him I was going to make this plug. I found a really interesting blog post that Talif put out in 2009 about distributing entropy. So if we go back to this thing about, well, how many of us manage web servers or other services in the cloud that don't have the typical sources of entropy that a desktop might have, and we might not even be able to plug a USB key into them. How do we get good quality entropy into them? And so Talif was talking about the way that he was doing that at that time, and I found that to, that to be really interesting, including Talif had some, some numbers about how much entropy was needed and how much was available and consumed. So I thought that that was, that was particularly interesting and very apropos, including some issues, and I don't know if this issue still exists about EGD, about clients reconnecting. I think that's what I think you reported the bug and I fixed it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. <laughs> so, with that, I'm ready to ask any questions, answer any questions that you might have. I, this is my, my, my blog site. I will uh, put the slides up on my blog, tmarble.info9.net. And as I mentioned, the mailing list is list.gag.com. This is my cat cuddles. <laughs> every, every presentation should have a cat. <laughs> Or rocket or both. We got both in this one. So what do you think? <laughs> Keith, do you want to say anything about Altos? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fairly simple implementation of this for this particular project. It's so one of the interesting hardware hacks here was that we have a bit sequence, sequence coming out of the comparator, and we're just shoving that into a spy input port on the processor. So it takes very little hardware overhead to actually read a stream of bits out of the out of the sequence, and they're nicely clocked by the by the by the CPU. So we're actually able to generate. We can saturate a USB link with random numbers in theory if we can actually generate random numbers that fast. Yeah, if they were actually random, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is a, a nice little USB uh, USB compatible processor, the NXP LPC 11U14. Um, they're not very free software, free hardware friendly company. I would love to find a better processor, but this one costs a dollar and forty eight cents for an ARM processor. So that is a kind of a compelling reason to use them. I would love to switch to. And they're physically very small. I would love to switch to something with a little more uh, free software. Uh, they have actually, there's actually software in the part that runs at boot time uh, that we don't have source to. Um, they have a closed source uh, uh, development environment, which is how they how they uh, try to get you to put stuff onto their part. Um, and when I and when somebody posted information about how to use an open source open hardware. Uh, uh, dongle to get uh, software onto the part on one of their on one of their fora. They actually deleted all of that data. Well, that's not very nice. Yeah. I think if you're prepared to go up to about one dollar ninety, two dollars, the really uh, STM thirty two F one o three forty eight pin QFP was what? No, it was the QFP was the one that we used on the entropy key. 
Um, and I have what foot LQFP 48? You already said that was too small. <laughs> <laughs> the entropy key is about what? Twice as long and the same width? Huge. No, the entropy key is about three times as long and the same width. Okay, right. Well, it has two most generations. Yeah. Um, but that's my point. What? Uh, well, we, we can talk about that, but you can get a 36 pin QFN version of the STM32, and more importantly, I have an open GCC based dev environment for it. Well, so do we. Well, so do we. <laughs> <laughs> it's in Debian. <laughs> 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 right. So 32L would be okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 As long as it's got USB. Well, let me ask. Uh, let me ask Tal. Let me ask you a question. How are you handling entropy these days? Mm. <laughs> To, it, it depends on which hat you're asking. If you're asking my DSA hat, we're actually still using the entropy keys because we got, either we bought a bunch or we got a donation, I can't remember. And yeah, something like that. And uh, so yeah, we're using that for my personal stuff. I actually don't use entropy keys at the moment um, and just cope. That's, uh, uh, as you point out, it's, not a terribly good, I, good solution. So, so if I, you if you had one, you might use it. Exactly. Um, in some cases, I've used the UB HSM, which is a it's an HSM HSM device, which is slightly more expensive at five hundred dollars. But the nice people at Ubico gave me one for free. So <laughs> that's nice. But it also can do uh, random number generation. So, so pretty good. Here. So what I wanted to say, I, I not so facetiously mentioned earlier that we had thought at one point that we might just make enough of them to bring and hand them out at DEPCON to sort of a getting some things into the market. But what we've really been talking about, because we have absolutely no idea how to gauge the level of actual interest from people who would actually spend money to buy the, one of these, is this is a classic example of something that you know we ought to use the Kickstarter-ish kind of model for, you know, one of those sites. and. And so my hope is that, you know, some number of months from now, once we've had a chance to go through another, you know, couple of hardware revs and get to something that we actually, you know, would not be ashamed to take a little bit of money from people for, that we can do one of those crowdsourcing things and just see. Um, I, you know, Keith and I have a fairly well-oiled machine for doing small batch um, product you know, assembly. The thing that we have not tried to do is deal with the what happens if we have a success disaster in one of these. And, you know, uh, it, it would be an interesting learning experience actually to find all of a sudden that we needed to figure out how to build 10,000 of something. But um, for doing, you know, hundreds or, or low number thousands, we have a pretty well oiled process for doing that and it's not expensive. So I, I, think, I think if we can get to the point where we have some kind of piece of hardware that we're happy with, turning that into something that people could actually just sort of go buy one of and use um, and have it be 100% open hardware, open source is not, not at all difficult for us to achieve. I'll also mention in passing that our most complicated product to date, something that we call Telemega, which is a six pyro channel, lots and lots of sensors, flight computer. Um, this past weekend at a launch out in Eastern Oregon, we had a chance to take a look at one that <coughs> some random guy took all the design data off our site, had a couple of raw boards made, taught himself how to hand play surface mount parts at home, and got three working boards, one of which was flown out in Brothers, Oregon last weekend. So, wow. Um, if, if you ever doubted the veracity of our assertion that all of our designs are 100% open hardware, open source, um, he actually used our build materials metadata to know which distributors to buy which parts from to load the board. You know, um, it really is all out there. So, whatever we end up with here will be in exactly that same category. And if we can end up, you know, not having sort of little hidden binary blobs in the parts we're choosing, so much the better. But uh, whatever we end up with, it will be completely reproducible by whoever wants to hack on them. I think you might find it very difficult to find a microcontroller without a hidden binary blob. I think they all have a boot ROM and you're not going to get the source for it. Uh, the only bits that exist inside the part on the STM32L we don't ever let execute. So, uh, Nibe, would you be willing to say a couple of words about your project? Uh, 
I will have my session. <laughs> I will have my session uh, Thursday morning. Okay. And that's for mainly for my GNUK token, but I will also address uh, my random number generator implementation, which is also free software and a free design, free hardware design. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> I've got a question concerning the SSH problem that it started too early. Um, can this be fixed if I reboot the SSH daemon later if the kernel has much more entropy? I think so. Yeah. And then maybe this should be made a default or... Yeah, maybe, it's, maybe it's as easy as a system D setting. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought systems tended to store some entropy on shutdown so that they could load it back up on boot. Not trusted, it's just a mixer. Right, okay. Um, from our experience, obviously, when I wrote EKD um, and put the together, I did a big bunch of profiling, which is actually much harder than it ought to be, yeah. because this is pre-perf and all the other um, nice things we can do now. But effectively, the kernel, because it uses random numbers for uh, everything from every time the process starts, it grabs 12 bits out of the pool so it can uh, change the stack base and do all the random placement. Every time it starts a TCP session, it goes away yes. and creates a new session thing and it yes. grabs three bits. What I discovered was is that a headless system or a system where it's not <coughs> where there are no large scale sources of entropy for it, um, often it will never ever actually get m enough bits to start the system. It, it will never get above its minimum dole out level. It, 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 so it might that's get to about one ninety six and then just give it all away, and that's the end of the message. So, so d when you when you had the the with the entropy key, how quickly does the entropy key become? Th does the actual entropy become available to the kernel after a boot? Well, we dump it into dev. The, the right we write it to dev random as soon as we are started. I mean, we, we can pull 20 kilobits a second off. 35 on the final product. 35 on the final product. So we put so 30. We can we can get 35 kilobits in under in a second. So, but the first four kilobits of that will uh, that we actually physically get out the first packet we dump straight into the kernel, and it, 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 I think I set EKD to start very very early. So, it's as soon as it's run, the kernel has more than ever. The problem was we we were always overfeeding. The dev sure, random pool sure. because there was because of this problem of figuring out who wants the entropy. So we just if you just send thirty five kilobits a second straight into that pool at all times, there's no no one will ever run out with the idea. <laughs> yeah. That's true. So I think what should be clear, it's certainly clear to me, is that just plugging a cute little piece of hardware into a USB spigot and launching EKD doesn't completely solve the problem. We have this issue of you know, when are things being started in the system, what's the state of the entry pool, entropy pool at the time various PRNGs are getting seeded and so forth. And so um, I would hope that maybe part of what we end up talking about as we work through sort of what we ought to do to you know, develop this piece of hardware and have it become something lots of folks want to use is all those ancillary things of, okay, um, what issues do we have in the set of sort of normally launched demons and should we be changing boot sequencing? Are there things that ought to be kicked sometime later? I'd love to see all of those things kind of get worked on in parallel. It's not enough to just, you know, have a piece of hardware and inject more entropy. Um, so I actually have no idea whether or not this has been thought about, but um, have has anybody put any work into coming up with a standard USB protocol for these types of devices, so we can have a single <coughs> driver that gets loaded immediately, fires up the USB device, don't have to worry about daemons or anything like that, and get randomness right off the bat? You could use the existing fuel. I believe one of the BSDs, I can't remember which one, actually did a kernel implementation of the EKI protocol in order to achieve that, so that they could hold off kernel boot beyond starting the USB stack and finding an entropy key. Um, they couldn't authenticate the key, but they could use it for sufficient entropy to get the system booted. 
that's one of the things that we've been thinking about is a way for uh, the kernel to be able to trust the key and how to do that. It's kind of tricky because you know the, it's physically connected and it's USB and there's all these sorts of things. But you know we have AES on the chip, and you know there's some pro perhaps some clever things that we can do to uh, you know secure the actual communications between the key and the and, and the kernel. Um, but you're right; it's really going to be interesting to see. You know how big of a delay is it if we w make certain things wait for entropy to come online, um, and you know maybe we can profile that and get that time down. There has actually been a little bit of interest in in doing that with a special target for system D. So I mean, some people were saying system D can s probably solve that problem, and it can at least help a little bit with it. And the other thing is, if you use uh, socket activation for SH, then your SH daemon is likely to start a bit later, which means that you actually won't run into the problem which was shown on the graph. Um, one thing that we did face when we did this the first time, you know, when we put the EKD out there, and was um, there was a very, within the sysadmin community, there's this thought that this just doesn't matter. Yeah, you've produced a very good presentation with all the papers, and the majority of people who don't get it immediately will turn around to you and say, um, "I can just use you." I, um, they literally just link you random to dev random. And make well, I mean, if you look away. at the bits coming off, they look random, right? Uh, that is exactly what they say. You know, you, you don't, don't laugh. That's exactly the result. That's exactly what you get told. So it's more of a, and I got told that from you know I, I'm implementing this within Debian, and I get told that a lot from a lot of you get a lot of pushback. So just be aware that when you come to do that, you're going to get a lot of, it's about a political and a social thing of all bits look random until, until they're not. Until they're not. <laughs> um, uh, again, what, to, to go back to one of your comments about needing to be able to monitor and understand the quality of what you're getting off these devices, it's exceedingly hard to measure true randomness yes. the moment you have done any processing on those bits. Yes, that's correct. And um, so we, within the entropy key, we had two generators, and we were actually doing analyses at the bitstream that was coming off each generator, the, um, the XORing of the two bitstreams okay. in order to do correlation analysis. Then we were doing debiasing of the bitstreams. This will be producing a very biased bitstream. There's no two ways about it. It's an electronic so you, circuit. You, had, you a had a, 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 a whitening algorithm on the chip. So there's, there's, bias, there's debiasing to whiten. Then you have yeah. to analyze that. Then, then we would mix and be analyzing at that point. But the moment you start to mix, you need to switch from the algorithms designed to monitor the quality of entropy in random streams to the algorithms designed to monitor the quality of pseudo-random streams. Yes. Because the moment you have software performing operations on it, you're actually behaving like a pseudo-random number <laughs> generator, not like a true random number yes. generator. And that's fine. You, you just have to know, to know to switch algorithms yeah. for monitoring. And, and FIPS 140-2 is a very weird thing because it behaves a bit like it's monitoring a true random generator, but the algorithms are keyed more towards pseudo-random generation. So on the entropy keys, we were performing the FIPS 140-2 monitoring after we were mixing things into mm -hmm. a hashing state. So um, there's, there's, again, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but it's really worth having two generators because you really need them for, for what you can trust. Okay, cool. fantastic. Steve, do you want to say something? Yeah, as an example of how people don't get this, um, there is a long open bug in Launchpad that a number of us have followed up to where there was a wish list bug opened against the, was it the hardware RNG tools package? Um, specifically asking people to basically to plug in devu random um, as a default at which point so you know <laughs> and a, a whole slew of people trying to um, chime in to explain to the pe to the person who asked for this in the first place why it was a bad, I bad idea and we're not trying to be condescending, we're not trying to tell you you're stupid, we're trying to explain to you why this is a bad idea no matter how um, expedient you think it might be at the moment so it doesn't if you go and get yourself a very very quick uh, PGP key 
of generation. If you're using PGP without useful randomness, you may as well not bother in the first place, but right. people don't get this. That's a, that's a, that's a really good point. The, the education here is not, not trivial. I mean, um, so uh, yes, I suspect we're going to run into a lot of pushback. So I think it depends. I think if you feel that it's necessary to convince everybody else out there running any kind of service that they need to care about this, then you have an incredible piece of rope to try and push. On the other hand, I have this, this sense that if we come up with a useful piece of hardware that generates you know, real entropy and we can make it inexpensive enough and we do the sort of cool thing of running you know, a Kickstarter-y kind of campaign on it, and we get sort of the right people in our extended community to go point at it and go, wow, this is cool, whether you understand it or not, you really want one of these, then it might very well be the case that you know, we make enough of a positive effect on sort of the community of collaborators that we really care about a lot that it's worth doing. And, and not just for our own servers, but it actually has makes some kind of dent out there. And whether that, you know, eventually leads to more people understanding the problem, caring about it, I don't know. I don't know how to solve that problem. But um, I don't get too hung up over the fact that, you know, not everybody's going to believe it or want it or care about it. There's certainly reasons you'd like to be able to convince people. I I'd love to be able to convince certain server hardware manufacturers, for example, to think that getting this right somewhere on one of their circuit boards was the right answer. But, um, you know, we'll see what can come. I was just thinking about Tollef's case and that, you know, he was distributing entropy to, you know, servers in a cloud and because of this SSH problem, you know, it's sort of a chicken and egg problem. But if you decided to delay SSH start until the kernel was sure and we trust the kernel's judgment that it has enough entropy to, to see those keys, so your startup is a little bit slower when you start something up in the cloud until you get enough entropy that then you, as SSH can be trusted, then you could tunnel a, a faster entropy stream in. There also was some work at some point to do a QMU uh, device, so you could actually just do this through Vart, Vart IO. I'm not entirely sure where, where that ended up going, but I'm sure Wins can tell us. Uh, I believe it was uh, Ian, Ian Moulton that was working on that. Um, no, Ian, Ian wrote, a wrote a set of drivers for that. I don't think it ever made it all the way upstream. Sorry, yeah, it got presented, and the QMU um, people, specifically Paul, uh, I forget his name, sorry, and a couple of the others uh, t basically turned around and decided f on behalf of everybody that QMU didn't want to be an EGD client ever, so they refused all the patches point blank. And it was at the time, you know, suddenly the word QMU was not being developed quite as much as we might like, so. I don't know whether the, 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 the format of uh, accepting things in QMU has improved, but that's, that's what happened to that patch series, you know, and, and I tried for some time to get up quite a lot of that push forward as well. It seems to be less of a futurist on that, so. Okay. Yeah, it's it. I so I seem to remember that actually they didn't like the patch and then ended up re-implementing it completely differently, but there is some support for giving you an PCI device, which is an RNG. Right, so it's using the host's random pool. Yep. Okay. Jimmy, do you have a question? Uh, I was just going to respond to Beadle's point about uh, uh, gaining acceptance of the value of this. I was going to say that uh, you know, even if there's still education needed, I think that it's probably a little bit easier to make people trade, uh, you know, tr make their trade-offs in favor of security a little bit more than it was a, a few years ago now that everyone's more aware of uh, the surveillance state. And um, uh, they're at least more open to hearing the usual ways that you do security have this big flaw that you're not noticing. And so it still needs education, but it's the pushback volume may be a little bit more amenable to 
uh, positive feedback loop overcoming it. So I think that we're out of time. Uh, we don't have any more talk scheduled until four anywhere, as far as I know. Um, okay. So you guys have lots of time, but yeah, if anyone has anything you want to do. Yeah. Other other questions? Go ahead. I just have a couple uh, general crypto questions. Uh, I think I heard at one point that uh, the uh, trusted platform module has a hardware RNG built into it. Is anybody aware of that? Um, and that's a, maybe a good segue to my next question is, is what if you have a hardware random number generator, uh, but you want to mitigate your risk because you don't completely trust it? Um, is there consensus in the crypto well, community no. that mixing is enough to do that? Or? Okay, I've got an idea. Um, Vince has an idea. There's another one here. So who wants to go next? Give it to Rob. Okay. <laughs> Uh, if you have a good source of random numbers, you can mix it with something that you know is untrustworthy, and it's probably fine. Yeah, that's basically what I was going to say. <laughs> um, I don't have any opinions about TPM. I guess... Um, <laughs> Regardless of TPM or not, um, there's a mechanism within, <coughs> at least the Linux kernel mixing process, to allow you to state when you hand over X bits of data that it only has Y amount of entropy value in it. And in fact, an EQD by default for every eight bits of data it hands over only claims seven bits of value. Um, th therefore, if you have a, a, a random stream that you believe to be okay, you can, uh, but it's really high speed, you could give it 4K at a time and tell it there's only 128 bits of entropy in there. And like Rob said, as long as there is some true entropy in there, a good mixing algorithm, and the, the Linux kernel one's pretty good. It's not the best, but it's pretty good and it's reasonably fast. Um, we'll spread that entropy out such that every bit of its possible output has been affected by every possible input entropy channel. One of the things that I, I found in researching this was that there is a, an interesting, relatively newer PRNG algorithm called Fortuna that didn't make it into the kernel, and I didn't really find out why. Does anyone know? Just, just curious. I'd love to you know learn more about that. Fortuna is a PRNG. Right. Um, so the idea is is that you can top it up with some real entropy you have, right. and then it satisfies all your requests from that. So it's basically like DevU random. Um, the FreeBSD people and so on, they use Fortuna. I think OSX uses Yarrow. Yarrow, Yarrow is the predecessor to, right. to Fortuna. Fortuna is just sort of like a tweak on it. But okay. it's, it is basically a PRNG that you occasionally reseed as you have data available. Mm -hmm. Whereas Dev random is, I'm sure these are actually random bits. Right, 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 right. Well, I mean, if you go shopping for PRNGs, we could talk about different qualities of PRNGs. My understanding is Fortuna is probably better than earlier implementations. It's a bit blowfish. Blowfish? Oh, I didn't realize that. Do you remember talking about Boy, do I? Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> Video stream. Uh, In that regard, what about uh, have GED? Um, I have that installed, but I also have an EKD that I'm mixing things in. and. I don't know if anybody's looked at that one specifically, but you know, your app get installed and you immediately have lots of entropy, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god, don't use that. Don't use what? Random sound. Random sound. Random sound. <laughs> oh. <coughs> I, I wrote I wrote a piece of Well, here we are. I've been reminded, so this is an apology. I did write a piece of software a while ago called Random Sound. It did make it into the archive. Uh, I think it was, that was Steve Grand's fault. Uh, so <laughs> everyone can blame him. Uh, which was based around the idea that if you had an audio input that was one that you could set to be a tri-state input, then you could use the noise around that circuit as a source of entropy. Or just use the lower bits from the ADC and you'll be fine, right? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and it would produce a very high high speed stream of data, but frankly I would trust it to be about one Shannon in 128 megs. <laughs> <laughs> and oh yeah, um yeah, the radio one. 
the, the, the comment where we were all shaking our heads. Uh, the problem with anything that, like that is that an attacker can put a coil of wire around your input and attack it very well, effectively. Well, that sort of requires <laughs> physical access, though, right? Right, but physical access is something you need to mitigate against when you have a physical device. Indeed. <laughs> Yes, but and and the the but part is just that at some point you have to decide how far you're going to go with yeah. that. I mean, anything that depends on thermal noise has you know the potential of being driven very far in one direction or the other with you know the application of a suitable doer of liquid nitrogen and or a, a blowtorch. So um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm not kidding. I mean, the, it, it it really is the case that if you care about this at that level, then you do have to physically protect the devices and you have to think about the right way to do that. And you know, the thing about a completely open design that's reflashable is you also have to think about, you know, the consequences of you know, how do you want to secure that? You know, is this an example of a completely open device that we ought to flip the bit on that says you can't USB reflash it? it you know, it, this is where Tom and I had a very serious conversation on IRC one night about, you know, should, should you ever let someone other than one of the three of us have one of these devices that they can reflash over USB without having to go get a programming dongle and put it on the you know the, the in wire pins. Uh, these are these are interesting questions. It's not like there's a single simple answer either. But um, this is why I say when you start thinking about what the potential attack surface is around something that's going to be as fundamental to your sense of the security of your system as the hardware random number generator, you have to think about these things. You have to make conscious decisions. And you bloody well need to document what your thinking was so that everybody else that's looking at it and thinking about using it or doing something with it understands what they're getting. And to me, that's part of why it's so absolutely vitally important that this time around what we do ends up being something that's a completely <coughs> open design that everybody can look at, everybody can think about. If somebody wants to create a a better derivative of, more power to them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. BDL, can't you just put like a TPM chip right here? <laughs> we, we will accept that so perhaps we shouldn't have made it more open last time, but we don't own the intellectual property anymore. So yeah, I, 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 you, you guys don't need to apologize. In case you hadn't noticed, lots of inspiration taken from the work yeah. done on the, the Semtech Entropy Key and EKD and all those sorts of things. Uh, mad props for... We're going to build on it. I, I, I actually found one to buy at LCA last you know January so that the ones I lost in the fire you know, didn't leave me without. And, uh, you know, mad props. Um, this is all about, you know, what do we do now? And, how do we go forward? How do we make sure that this kind of stuff becomes and remains available for those of us who need it? Did you have another comment, Rob? Uh, I was just going to say that um, for the sort of attack of dipping it in liquid no uh, nitrogen or blowtorch, the entropy key had a temperature sensor. So it went, nope, I'm too warm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> My numbers aren't random anymore. Don't trust me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Feature yes, creep. I oh, right, right. <laughs> Feature creep. <laughs> it, it literally blew its fuses and um, until the fuse went on, the last of them. Sorry, thanks for that, bye. It's actually reliable. Heat was a software fuse. Yeah, heat was a software. What was the question here? Uh, pass that back. Apparently, the temperature sensor is so good that my colleague uses it to monitor the temperature of his house while he's working away from home. <laughs> <laughs> He's welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, we certainly didn't think of created uh, of creative hacks for other sensors that we could put on the board. Hmm. He sometimes gets entropy out there as well. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should put a webcam on it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, any other uh, thoughts or questions? Oh, see. So I never did get around to picking up enough entropy keys for my own uses, um, and now it's hard. Um, in the future, when you go into series production with these, any idea on price? What do you think you can do them for? Pass that to the business department. <laughs> 
So the, so the problem is that um, I've gotten very good at figuring out based on the raw bill of materials what I have to charge in order to be able to continue to operate a business in a high power model rocketry world where there's a certain flavor of customer support that we have to engage in and there's a certain you know, sort of turn on rate on the complex boards. In by many measures, uh, this is a substantially simpler piece of hardware. It is going to have a similarly complex, you know, bench verification for each unit um, before I would be willing to take money from somebody. So I don't exactly <coughs> know the answer. This is certainly in the, it's in the sub $50 range US, but um, how much below that, I don't know. Certainly if we do a kickstarter -y kind of thing, it'll be, you know, cost plus. And then if we actually sell them for realsies after that and have to inventory them, it'll be different. That's exactly the kind of thing that I'm looking for. That's the key bench test. Yeah, I, I, can't, wow. I can't imagine it. I cannot imagine asking. Okay, I know what to look forward to. <laughs> And it'll have a pretty plastic box, too. <laughs> Will it be Altus Metro Blue? <laughs> no, because Hammond doesn't make a box in that shit. <laughs> <laughs> White or black, which is your choice? Well, that is unless we can get um, Jeff to find us that color in the right spool for the printer. Print your own case. You can print nice, dense that would be wonderful. Okay. Well, I think we're about done. We're done. If we're talking about 3D printing swirls, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone.